Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're going to be closing out chapter 8 um, with a review. And before we get into the review, closing out chapter 8, we're going to of course um, look back at the, last, the solution to the last example. All right, so let's go in. So the last um, episode, we looked at a an example program called Client Server in which we got some questions coming in from a client and we were able to distribute, spin up some servers to answer the question and then return the solution to the client. And then after we look at that, we're going to review Go Routines and then we're going to get a preview um, into the next chapter, which is going to be on types. So before we go and um, review Go Routines, let's go look at our example program and fix that first. So usual thing i copy the example from before into a new directory and start up my editor here so what was the to do the to do was to create a client response structure type and in that type we're going to have the question and the answer and the reason we wanted to do that is so that when we get here we'll return instead of returning a string we return a client um, we'll be sending on the channel a client response type so which would be this guy so I'll make a copy of this and so let's do that so um, the structure I'm gonna cheat a little bit and um, make this do a copy here and then this and then I'm gonna call it client response okay and then we don't need to send back to the client the duration at least not in this example or which server replied so we are going to send back the question and the answer to the client all right so we have that and then here's our hub and we're going to make a out channel that's not string but client response so we're going to do that and of course we have to change this to that and we're going to pass that through so our handler here must take a so this is the out channel so it's going to return a channel of um, so here it's getting response from uh, so this is the out channel uh, let me see I have to scroll over let me hide this here so I can see the rest of it and uh, we need to, need to make this a little bit more big okay so okay so it's the weight group and my answers and so it's returns there's a channel where it gets the answers from and so what do we do um, here we compose the response that we get from a server so this is where you can get possibly get answers from servers and we now send that to a client so that is pretty simple we just do this and we do that and we say question is the question and then we do this comma answer is no answer and up here we do the same thing and we say no we could just create an object up here and then assign values to it so we can simply say um, var result or response or client response for example client response is this guy and it has those fields and then we can set it here and say um, my client response that answer is equals to answer that answer that a that I got back from the server and then client response that question is equals to whatever the question was right now um, we could get the question from uh, the answer to so actually um, we can actually do something like this we can do this is equals to this that question that the question and I already have that initialized so we don't have to change anything and then here I just send Client response and here I just say client response that 
answer is equals to and then I do this and then we send back client response okay so this is just another way of doing so simplify things a little bit okay um, what's the cannot type that as type string oh is it still type string oh I'll put here um, paste that okay all right so I'm gonna send my thing then probably an update but oh well all right so what else do we need to do um, in our function main where we're looping around we get an a client response is a client response from this thing and so now we can say um, let's do percent F add percent F on B sorry and then I'm gonna do backslash new line backslash tab and then the answer is gonna come below so question and give the question and then the answer is gonna be below percent V command percent V new line and so now I give a that question and then a that answer okay and so now let's run it and see what we get um, so this should be fine syntax error expected a expecting comma um, I don't know why it's saying that but I have the comma in there so I think it's my editor gain which I've yet to fix go run I go run main answer data questions I think and there we go all right so the question was question one and the answer was question one answered question was question three and answer again ask again later and you get the idea oh no server response um, well this one was messed up and let's see why because here we shouldn't be putting the answer in the question <laughs> so we've overridden the question so let's go take a look at our um, handler here and yep we overwrite overrode the question it's supposed to be the answer answer and now we go back we let that save and we run it and now we see question two no answer from the servers um, yeah no server response right all right so that makes sense so that's pretty much the solution I think the only other thing that I suggested was that we can um, get question from multiple have questions submitted from multiple clients and so now we can have um, if we had question from multiple clients what we would need is for the hub to know well okay I have a question from a particular client so I'm going to tell the server to respond on that client and to respond there so instead of um, this being the well it could look at it could save it and look it up so it could do a map to the questions and then where the result should go and then look it up when it gets back a response and before it sent back the response it just retrieve that oh this is the response I'm gonna handle or I have a response for this is the question I have a response for look it up in the map and send the response there but I'm not gonna do that again that's pretty I think you guys know to do that pretty straightforward but I kind of want to go review the rest of the chapter and then give you a preview of the next chapter um, the last two videos were both like an hour long so um, but if you still have question about how you would do multiple clients just let me know and then I could do like a separate follow-up video right so again if you want to do multiple clients you'd want the clients to be able to create the channel on which they get in the response so what they'd be sending is not just a question they would actually be sending a client request so you can you know take something like this and then say well I have a client response but also I have a client request and a client request would be a question and where the client wants its response back and they want the response back on a client 
client response channel, right? And a channel that sends back client response. And so, um, when your client sends a request, they would make also a channel where they want the response to come. And so now when they submit, what they're really submitting is not a channel of strings, only just questions. They're submitting a client request, which includes the question and where they want back their response. So they only need to make one ch channel for response. That's where they're gonna get back their response. So my response channel, let's call it my response channel make channel of client response request response and that's where you'll get the response back this returns a client request channel and so here the client would be submitting client request which is the question the question they want to send and the channel and where they want the channel to respond, which would be my response, sorry, there. All right, so that's what they'll be descending. Bam, 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 and that's be out. And of course, now you have to start modifying everything else. Um, here, this here is so gonna be of client request. And so now you have to start modifying what the channel in main now this is going to be so you just go down now and start modifying everything else accordingly and so again i don't want to take too much time but you see how you can you can do that of course you need now a map in the hub um, where you're going to be storing the question and the, from the client and their response channel so that when you get back a response from the handler you really have to tell the handler, hey, I want you to send the result to this channel, this client's channel that they want. Okay, alrighty. So let me now close this out and go finish off the review of chapter eight. Oh, um, we might have to come back and we'll see. All right, so let's expand this. So, Remember, go routines, if the key takeaway here, and this is not everything about go routine, but these are some of the key takeaway. Go routines are lightweight, very, very lightweight. They can be thousands of go routines per one OS thread, okay? Remember, you don't have to say uh, how many OS threads to use because by default, it's gonna use how many you have, um, OS threads for the number of cores you have. De depending on however your operating system sees core, that's what Go is gonna use, and so we play with the Go um, the max proc thing, um, you don't need to mess with it as we saw, right? The other point is, back up a little bit, is go routine executes a function context. We, we cover that, I think, in section two of this chapter, when we look at, when you use it, you say go, when you create a go routine, it really creates a context in, on, under which all function invoked at that point run under the same context. Even if multiple go routine calls some fun function foo, each invocation of foo run under the context under which its parents was called and keep going up and up until you reach that go routine. Even main is run onto, um, by a go routine, right? And so um, you want to remember also, I don't have it here because it's not really a key takeaway of go routine, but you want to remember that all your go routine exit when, main, when the main function exit or the main go routine exit or the go routine that runs main. Um, the other thing is GoRoutine makes it easy to think and program with concurrency. Remember, concurrency is a pattern, how you think about stuff. And we're going to look at the next slide, we're going to look at that. Um, the other thing is if all your GoRoutine are blocked, your program panics and, you know, exit. That's because Go doesn't, the Go runtime doesn't see any way in which your program could make any progress if they are all blocked waiting on, on something, deadlock, right? So. Um, if there's no way out of it, it's not waiting on a timer, but instead one go routine is waiting to send to the other one, to another one, go routine A is waiting to send to B, and B is waiting on A, then nothing is ever going to happen because A would never be able to send to B to allow B to progress because B is waiting on A and, you know, A and B is waiting on A and A can't send to B and so vice versa. 
they're gonna the program deadlocks all right now i want to revisit this idea of concurrency and parallelism so if you remember what i said concurrency is not parallelism. and i who really said it is robert pike and if you haven't it was in the resources i provided earlier in chapter uh, in section four or something I can't remember what section um actually it was in section one also there was a link some links to things you can go watch and one of them is concurrency is not parallelism and it's by robert pike and you definitely want to go oh, one extra uh, quote over there and so from this quote from Robert Pike it's also as we said when you watch that video uh, when people hear well, let me just skip to this part and basically concurrency is about dealing with lots of things at once okay which is you're generating data you're consuming data right we have a generator generating questions and then we have the servers you know trying to figure out how to answer that those questions so that's concurrency dealing with lots of things at once parallelism is about doing lots of things at once right and so you want to try and keep those two things separate once your program is concurrent it's possible that oh, it can be paralyzed possible again if you have the hardware and all this other stuff okay but um the two things are not related you can have a concurrent program and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's run in parallel, especially if you only have one processor, but you can always still have concurrency even if you have one processor because you can deal with sort of things, lots of things at once. It doesn't mean at the same time, instant in time. We cover that with all our charts when we look at, you know, how Go routines are created and how they're different from OS threads, right? When we look at that, I think it was chapter six, uh, nine or 10, when we look at what Go routines are, or 11, can't remember which one, but anyway. Um, we can go back real quick to see which section that was but that's when we had all these charts here about trying to break down how go routines versus or processes and so on so that was in section 10 okay so definitely keep that in mind when you start thinking about um, go routine and OS threads and parallelism okay so now I have to go through all these animations which now I kind of yeah, whatever. So that's pretty much the review of um, chapter eight. And hopefully you really enjoy working with Go routines. Hopefully that's one of the things that really stands out to you in this language. There are many other things that should have st stood out to you by now, but this is also one, one of those really nice ones, like channels I think should really have made you go, oh, if I haven't thought about programming this language before, seriously, once you saw channels and then now you saw see go routines and channels, you really like it. The next couple of chapters, we're gonna also be covering some really cool things too. So next chapter, chapter nine is gonna be on, let me save this, it's gonna be on, so let's do, um, let's make a directory call, well, actually I don't wanna make a directory to show you this, um, but maybe, all right, so, hmm. Yeah, let's make a directory call chapter, uh, let's call it preview. And let's go into preview. And I'm gonna do go code, of course, and startup editor, and I'm gonna do our usual main that go and package main and function main. And we're gonna do fmt that print ln and preview chapter nine preview preview yep. okay all right so that works so what are types well we've seen them before right we've done this before we've done type person or what we just did type request right is a struct with you know a question and question which is a string and an answer which is a string and you know some s server id which is an int right that's we've introduced our our own type and we did that because we don't want to have to say um var a you know let's say request one request zero is struct and have to retype all of this again you know 
we don't want to have to do that so and then over and over when we're ready to do you know request another variable request one we have to retype the same thing over and over and then of course now it becomes cumbersome when we want to assign values so if we want to assign a value we want to set a or sub the question we ask a question you know answer and then five or something like that and now this become var that equals okay um, so this is called a struct literal and we've seen it too with um, function literal when we go do go routine and again let me encapsulate this guy and then if we want to do another question another answer and 10 okay so this is really cumbersome and difficult to, to get to read and understand very easily. And of course, it's complaining because we're not printing them out. We're not using them, right? All right, so request zero, you get the idea, request one. And so having types makes it easier for us instead of having something that look like this and this work, I wanna go show you it, it works. Um, you know, instead of having that, we can just get rid of this and just say request and request, All right? And no, this works well. Code is not as cumbersome. Everything remains the same. Um, where this really shines is if we had a function that we wanted to write. Let's say we had, we went back to what we had before. And we want to write a function foo um, print um, question. And so our function now should take this type, right? So it's to take a request and of this structure type. So now we gotta paste this. Uh, I have to do struct, you know, and then paste all this stuff inside of it. And then, um, you know, FMT that print LN question, bam, that um, request that Q, right? And so um, if I want to print call print question with request zero and the same thing with request one, that's what that would look like. And again, we could see how cumbersome this is is in the parameter list, whereas we can just easily take this out and put request, similar here, take this out, make it request. So it's not only when you're declaring variables also, in a structure, structure when you're doing, passing it to function and so on, it just really helps. So we have essentially introduced our, new, our own type, so we put type here. Now, something key to understand, let's say this is request one, uh, let's call this server request actually. Server request, uh, response. This was supposed to be response, but um, whatever. Let's get, make, let's, let's simplify things. And so let's call this server request response. And let's make another one, which is going to be our client response. Oh, please excuse the noise in the background. Client response. So notice both have the same fields, Q and A, and they're actually in the same order, which doesn't really matter, but they, here they do. So let's make this a server request and then server request response sorry server response server response let's make this a client response client response client response and now our function here we're gonna say it takes a server response now notice all to a sudden um, so server response this cannot work because this is a different type, even though the fields are exactly the same. 
you cannot get these guys to work, right? And when I try to run this, it's gonna tell me that, hey, cannot use CR type client response as type server response, right? It checks it and ensures. So types are strictly checked in Go. Even if they might look at the same, have the same footprint, um, they're different types. So good. All right. So that is not the only way you can create a type. In Go, you can create a type for anything. So here's another example. Um, in code, we were doing things like, um, you know, well, let's say there is a simple one. This is a very simple one. We can say type my, um, I can say type my ID or student ID, for example. And student ID is what? A string or int, right? We could decide what whatever we want student ID to be. And of course, now we can start making IDs of, you know, we can say var x, you know, student ID is equals to five, for example. And so we can say print ID, print student ID, and we can say ID student ID and fmt that print ln and i can say id okay and so um sorry this should be here this is a function ha <laughs> try to put too many things and so now i can say print student id and give it student um this id x okay and so that works. So you can introduce types for anything that you want to, you know, reuse or convey an idea, any abstraction. So if you have the idea of, or the concept of a student ID in a program, introduce a type for that to encapsulate what a student ID is. And later on, if you need to change it from an int to a string or something else, then fine, you have to you could go do that and you'd see in your program where it breaks and it needs fixing, but at least you have a, type to represent that concept and so it makes programming um, and writing much cleaner code and the intent of what you want to do uh, much clearer okay then just if you're just batting this wrong as an int now you said there's a student id and you can see in functions where it takes student id as to just it takes an int or a string or whatever it might be okay so that is much clearer the intent is much clearer um and so um let's just show that 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 works and oh wait a second oh i'm still trying to call this guy here so this is not gonna work so let's take that out and so uh declare but not used uh, come on um uh, let's just do that all right and so right and so you can see it works right so i can pass something um, so we're going to learn more about types in the next chapter and you can see all kind of interesting ways we can create types and so on and this is going to prepare us for when we get to chapter 10 where we're going to start learning about you know objects and methods but this is the foundation just like how we use channels as a foundations before a foundation before we got to go routine and then once we got to go routine we said oh go routines are pretty much indispensable without channels and while you could spin up go routine without channels it's not as much fun as when you have go routine talking and using channels right same thing here with types types gonna lay the foundation for something else that we want to, re to really learn okay so that's the kind of preview i know it's not very exciting preview um but hopefully it just sort of at least make you think hmm, it's nice that i can create types my own types for whatever and it's very straightforward it's type keyword type the name that you want to introduce and then the thing after and you can introduce keyword types for anything um you know you can introduce so we have function literals if you remember we're doing things like um go funk you know and then some function I, let's say our function has a type here so it had i is int and s is a string for example and then we'll go run that and of course we'll pass i the verb i and a string um name whatever 
right? And we go run that and we do whatever we need to do inside of this go routine. Now, another thing we can do is this is called a function literal. And of course, we can store this in a variable. We can say, you know, var my go routine or my func equals to, to, um, is equals to that. I could do that. Or I can even just drop out the var and just say colon equal, right? All right, so now I have that. Um, then I can say go, uh, go my func and then pass it like that. So that works just as if I had said created an actual function. So, so, that, so that worked. But what about type, right? I can say that oh, this um, variable, my func, must be assigned a function that matches this signature. So I can copy this and I can create a new type and I can say type, um, I don't know, my func um, has this signature of func blah, blah, blah. And so now um, I can say my func, my function variable has this type and there's the particular value, this particular value, there's the value I'm gonna assign to it, okay? And then now I can run a function, um, this go routine, spin up spin up this go routine to, to run that, to use this variable, which is instead using this function. Now, why might I wanna do this? Is because if I want to reuse my func later on to get another, um, to assign it to another anonymous function, it ensures that I must use some function that has the exact same signature. Okay. Right. So it makes sure that I can only assign to my func this variable function literals that have this signature, right? Then I might want to enforce that for whatever reason in my program. And so, um, or even assign even a function, a, not a function literal, but you know, some function goo takes on an int, i is int and ss is string. And so now this can actually be assigned to my func is equals to go and then I could say go my func again and then I could pass in 21 and this works too. Again, all three places my func variable was is a type of a function that takes an integer as a first parameter and a string as the second parameter and then I can call go on that, right? Um, so anyway, see in the next, as you can see, this program runs without any issue. The reason we're not seeing anything is because we're not doing anything in our functions, the different functions. And also if I was doing something, we learned, we know already that oh, if you try to spin up a Go routine and just exit like that, it's just too fast and they all get killed. So again, hopefully this idea of being able to create your own type to represent what you want um, is exciting. Um, we're going to see a whole lot much more of this. I'm going to send this a preview, but then I'm tempted to even show you more. But again, just like how we use the type here, student to create a function and say, well, our function accept this type. We can do the same thing now that we have a type to represent this function signature. We can create function that says it takes that type. So is this would be, for example, like uh, goo here. We can say goo um, take some function f of type my func, right? And it accept that function to work on. And so maybe instead of going this way, you can say goo takes, you know, my func variable. And then um, we, we were able to call now um, goo with a pointer, a reference to this last func variable here. And then within here, goo actually invoke func with, you know, 42 and life of the universe. All right, so uh, I, I, I don't wanna make it too confusing now until we actually start using it, but it just sort of shows you 
the kind of capability you have now in simplifying your program. Just imagine if we had to write this signature here in this place, it would still work. You can still read it, but this I admit I think is much easier than if you were trying to read if you had copied this and put it in its place. Don't worry, this is just a preview. Don't be discouraged, don't get worried. But like everything else I've covered so far, I try to introduce very little piece at a time. And so that's exactly where we're gonna start. We're gonna start chapter nine with doing very, zero simple type, very, very simple types, like types of ints and strings and Boolean and stuff like that. And then we'll build on it. So it's gonna take us a while before we get to doing types all. Well, We'll cover a lot of other things for us before we do types of function and so on. All right, take care and see you in the next video. This is already way longer than I want it to be. Okay, take care. Thanks for subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, subscribe and invite others to subscribe. See you in the next video. Goodbye.